So over the last several weeks, we've been, we've been making our way through this series called Close Encounters as we look at these moments that we read about in the Bible and in the moments of these different lives of different people where God just shows up and really breaks into their lives and breaks into their situations in this, I, I, I don't know a better word, but this radical, massive way, right? And every single person we look at experiences spiritual breakthrough in their lives just because God shows up. And when God shows up, God changes everything. He just changes everything. And we've talked about this before, but I really believe that breakthrough is something God longs to lead every single one of us into individually in the different situations, different circumstances that we're facing. He has breakthrough ahead of us. Okay, but I also believe that he has this for our church. And I wouldn't be pastoring here if I didn't firmly believe that the best days are ahead of us because we're still moving with God and He always has something better. He always has breakthrough ahead of us and He's leading us into that here in our community, right? So just to kind of set up what we're looking at again today, I just want to give you, I just want to give you this image, right? The Kool-Aid man. Now, we're not going to drink the Kool-Aid today. Don't worry, right? It's not, it's not that kind of service, right? I know, you've got to be careful when you talk about Kool-Aid in church anymore. Okay, so it's this commercial, though, that, that we, we've, we've all kind of grown up with this now, this, this image of the Kool-Aid man. And uh, now, back when I was a kid, I know I sound old when I say that now, uh, but back in my day, the, the commercials were a little more intense than what they are today. Today, it's like Kool-Aid man dancing or something. But, but, but back when most of us were growing up, right, you start off and the kids are outside and they're on the play equipment or they're outside and they're maybe in a gym and they're playing basketball, right? And they're worn out. They're tired. They're drained. They don't know what to do. They're about to drop. And then they call out, hey, Kool-Aid man, right? And the next thing you know, man, he comes busting through a fence. I mean, he breaks the whole thing down or he comes busting through the wall, right? And bricks go flying everywhere. And suddenly everything changes. Okay, now in the one sense, you have this, this restoring that takes place because, because he brings this refreshing Kool-Aid and every mom and dad knows it's really a sugar rush that he's bringing into the lives of these kids. I'm not saying it's the healthiest thing, but just hang with me. I never, no illustration's ever perfect, but just go with me here, okay? So he's restoring on the one hand. But on the other side, you've kind of got this, this mess, because he's intense, man, and he's smashed through this wall or this door or this fence, and now you've got all this debris just kind of hanging around. I don't know really what's up with that, but okay. Now, when I was three, I was convinced that he was going to break through the closet at my grandma's house, right? And, and, and so I just got to, I'm opening up bearing my soul to you today, okay? So I had this vivid dream, and I think we could call it a nightmare, when I was three years old, that he was going to break through the closet at my grandma's house, and let's just face it, this guy's a little freaky looking, right? I mean, he's a Kool-Aid pitcher with legs. It doesn't get much freakier than that, okay? So it's confession time, right? My name is Kirk, and when I was a little kid, one of my greatest fears was the Kool-Aid man, Okay? Now, greater than my fear over the Kool-Aid man, though, was my desire to experience the change that he brought into the lives of all these kids that I saw in these commercials. And so every day that I was at my grandma's house, when I was three, I would go into her back porch where this closet was, and because I didn't want to experience the mess and I only wanted to experience the change, I would go and I would open wide the doors of my grandma's closet and then I would go all the way across the other side of the room and I would just sit there and I would wait with a little bit of excitement and a whole lot of anxiety because this guy kind of freaked me out, okay? And so this is what I did day after day and week after week because I was convinced in my three-year-old brain that the Kool-Aid man was going to break through that closet one of these days. I just wanted to be prepared for that moment when it happened. Okay, But when it didn't happen, I was really disappointed. Now, in the one sense, I was relieved because, again, he's a freaky dude. But on the other side, I was really disappointed, and I started to have, at the age of three, a crisis of faith in the Kool-Aid man. Because what is going on where he appears to all these other people in the commercials that I see day after day, but he's not coming through and breaking through into my life 
when I need him. And so what do I have to do and what's wrong with him, right? So I share this bizarre and, and slightly sad moment in my life at the age of three only because I believe that how I, I behaved and acted around, you know, Kool-Aid man is how many Christians behave and how many people believe about God. We've heard how God has broken into the lives of, of other people, right? And, and so he's breaking into the lives of the people that we read about in the Bible. He's breaking into the lives of the people that we know. He's breaking into the lives of people that we don't know that we read about or, or, or shared with us about how God has moved in, in lives of people we don't know. And, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, but in some ways it's, it's, it's if we've seen the commercial, right? We know the basic formula of what's supposed to happen. We've got people who are, who are worn out and, and they're broken and they're at the end of, of their rope. They're at the end of themselves. And finally, in this, in this moment of desperation, they cry out, Hey, God! Right? And, and, and bam! You know, God is supposed to burst in on the scene and He's going to smash through the problem and He's going to bring relief and He's going to change everything. But now here's where we wrestle. Because many times when we try to live this out, and, and we're in our moment of desperation, we're like, hey, God, it's me, right? Many times God doesn't burst through the wall, so to speak. We don't always experience the breakthrough that we want to see that we're looking for when we expect it. We don't see the breakthrough in, in our homes and our families, how we want to see that take shape. And we don't see the breakthrough in our job where we're just elevated and we're just lifted out of whatever deal we're facing. We, we don't have the breakthrough where we just instantly are, are freed up from this addiction or we're set free from whatever deal that we're wrestling with in life that we've been wrestling with for a long time. And, and even though we've done everything that we thought that we're supposed to do to prepare for this, even though we've, we've opened wide the closet door and, and we've come over and, and we're sitting and we're staring and, and we're waiting and hoping and wishing, you know, for this to come, you know, it doesn't just come in, into our life and, and the breakthrough we look for doesn't just, just happen. And, and when God doesn't show up like we want Him to and in the ways that we want Him to and how we want Him to and when we want Him to, we, we become disappointed Anyone feel me on that? And we can have a crisis of faith. And we wonder, man, what? God, I'm doing everything. What is wrong with you? And why aren't you breaking through to me? And why am I not getting the breakthrough that, that I see other people getting that I want in my life? But before we blame God, I, I just want to throw out a few questions. What if the problem isn't him? But it's that we tend to treat him like he's the Kool-Aid man. What if it's not about turning to him only after I've tried everything else? <coughs> only in my moment of desperation? What if it's not about passively waiting as I sit and I stare and I wish and I hope? What if it's not about God conforming to me and my ideas and my hopes and my expectations of how things are supposed to be? What if the problem and the reason we don't experience breakthrough that we long for in our lives, what if the problem isn't with God but it's really with us? I know I'm... I'm kind of getting heavy here, but hang with me. Because I, I want us to look specifically at how we're preparing and we're positioning ourselves for this breakthrough today. Okay? Because the one truth that we've seen in every single encounter that we've looked at in this series and, and so many more that, that you and I have journeyed with together over the years, there's this one truth that is always consistent. God longs to bring breakthrough. Do you believe that today? Yeah? He wants to bring breakthrough into your life and into my life so that we know him more fully. And so how do we experience this? How do we position? How do we prepare ourselves for this moment? Now, there's a massive close encounter moment that I want us to look at today in the life of a guy named John that we read about in the first chapter of Revelation. But before we open that up, 
And there's a lot to unpack there, believe me. But I want us to back up just a little bit to get in, like get a running start into this moment, if we could put it that way. So John, the guy who writes what we call the book of Revelation, right? John is, is one of the original disciples of Jesus. Now, by the time that he experienced this, this vision, this, this close encounter moment with the risen Jesus, right, he's like 90 years old. We're about 60 or maybe 70. We're not exactly sure just how old John was when he started following Jesus. Some estimate him to be like an older teen, right? And so we're about 60, maybe 70 years after Jesus has died and he's risen from the dead and now he's ascended back into heaven. Christianity has spread all across the Roman Empire, all across the the known world. I mean, we're already down to India by this time. I mean, it is amazing how far the word of God has spread over 60 or 70 years. But at this point, especially in the Roman Empire, there's intense persecution. Many Christians have given their lives following Jesus. Many more have been ripped away from their families, imprisoned, beaten, I mean, you name it, ostracized. I mean, they've gone through some heavy stuff. John was not executed for his faith in Jesus, but instead he was exiled to a penal colony on the rocky island of Patmos. Now, when you hear Patmos, think Alcatraz, only 10 times bigger and a whole lot meaner. It is this volcanic mass of rocky crag that is just surrounded on all sides by open sea. It's about 10 miles long, 5 miles wide. It's 40 miles away from the nearest point of civilization. Yeah, you're not going to swim your way free this time. Most people banished to this hard labor colony just wasted away and died. And this is the nice vacation resort that John was sentenced to live at, probably for the rest of his life. At least that's what the sentence would have been at the time. We know different. But here he is on the island. His strength is failing in his old age, 90 90 plus years of age. His heart is breaking. Right, Because he's lonely, he misses his, his family, his friends, his church family that he has poured his life into. He's ripped away from all of them. And he just wonders, how much longer am I going to have to survive on Patmos? How much longer? That's the question, right? How much longer until I can see my Christian brothers and sisters again? Will I ever see them again? How much longer until Jesus is just going to break in? And just change everything in my Patmos experience. How much longer till he breaks in and makes everything wrong in the world right? And so here John sat and he's all alone and he's isolated on this barren rocky island for days that turn into weeks, that turn into months, just longing for God to break through. And that brings us to one particular moment And one particular Sunday, and this is what we read in Revelations chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Now I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in patient endurance to which Jesus Christ calls us. Now I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. And it was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit, and suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast, and it said, write in a book, or maybe your Bible says scroll, everything that you see, and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, and and Smyrna, and Pergamum, and Thyatira, and Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. It's a title for Jesus, in case you're confused there. right? And he was wearing this long robe, this priestly robe, with this gold sash across his chest. And his head and his hair were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing flames of fire, and his feet were like polished bronze refined in the furnace, and his voice thundered like a mighty ocean waves. And he held seven stars in his right hand, and and there was a sharp two-edged sword that was coming from his mouth. His face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and he said, don't be afraid, 
For I am the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. And now write down what you have seen, both the things that, that are now happening and things that will happen. And this is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, now, just pause there. I know that there's a lot more that, that he goes and opens up for us. Okay, but this is this incredible close encounter moment between John and, and Jesus in his full glory, right? As Jesus just breaks through to John right there on that Alcatraz island of Patmos, right? And, and he just changes everything. And again, there's a lot to unpack. We're going to get to some of that, but, but today I want us to focus on how this took shape. Because what he shows us, what John shows us is not this kind of passive, you know, Kool-Aid man kind of waiting. But instead what he shows us is this, active, consistent, intentional pursuing of God. Okay? That's the kind of waiting, that's the kind of life that God has called us into. So I, I just want you to get those points today. They're, they're already on the back side of your bulletin. But repeat after me these words. Active, consistent, intentional. Okay? This is what John shows us. And now let's just open this up so we can see this, this more clearly. This active, consistent, intentional life. Now, before John shares everything with us in this close encounter moment... He tells us what he's been doing. And so this is what we read. If we were just back up to just the first part of verse 9. I, John, am your brother and I'm your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus has called us. Now, just, just hold on there because John begins with these three different things. Suffering and the kingdom of God and patient endurance. So what does that mean? Let's just start there. Okay, so suffering that he's describing the word is particularly talking about here, trouble and hardship, and he's using it in a, a specific context. Now, trouble and hardship, we could just kind of have general suffering, but the specific content is that all of this is hitting your life because of your faith in Jesus, okay? So real suffering is what he's talking about. And I just want to I just want to kind of talk about this because sometimes I don't think we get what real suffering is in our American context as opposed to what goes on around the world. So let's just kind of open this up because there's a difference between what we would call real suffering and frustration. These are not the same thing. Okay? And a lot of times we kind of conflate the two. Okay? So what we're talking about is is, is not about you having a bad day at work. And what we're talking about is not you overdrafting on your checking account and maybe being declined as you swipe your card at Walmart. We're not talking about that today. What we're talking about is not falling behind someone who's driving slower than you through town or, or just sits at a green light, you know, when they're supposed to stop at red lights. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about you getting a stain on your favorite shirt. I get that all of those are frustrating moments and all of those have the capacity to make us upset and even angry, okay? I, I get that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about real suffering. Okay, so let me give you some examples of what we're looking at, right? Real suffering is being ridiculed or, or physically accosted or worse because of your faith in Jesus. I get that we don't really experience a lot of that in America, although we see some of that. Real suffering, though, is... It goes beyond that. Real suffering is also watching a family member that you love walk away from Jesus or reject Jesus. That's real suffering. Real suffering is when you refuse the job or the promotion because the people who would put you in that position know that you follow Jesus. So they intentionally overlook you, bypass you because of your faith in Jesus. That's real suffering. Okay? It's about your faith in Jesus. But, but there's also real suffering that just hits our lives. Right? And so real suffering happens when we wrestle with deep loss. Real suffering is, is coming out of abusive struggles, right? Real suffering is, is trying to overcome, you know, when life takes this massive tragic move and suddenly you're just hit in this tragic way and you're struggling to overcome that. that that's real suffering, okay? That's very different than the frustrating situations. And so while we have to endure uh, you know, regular suffering in this world, and we also have to endure suffering for our faith. This is what we also know. 
that Jesus died for us. And what we know is that in his death, he went through ultimate suffering, right? He died for our sins, but he also rose from the dead, and he is alive forevermore. That's what we just glimpsed, his glory in heaven, right? And because he lives, he is now ushering in his kingdom, okay? It's a kingdom that lasts for all eternity, and it's breaking into our reality even now, one life at a time. And so John tells us the truth. Yes, yes, there is suffering in this world. And yes, sometimes it's because of your faith. And just because you're living in a world that is scarred with sin, you're going to experience suffering. Some of that's just going to splash on you. And I get that that's not pleasant. Okay, but don't be so obsessed with that that you miss the truth that in the midst of this moment, there is now a kingdom, the kingdom of God that is breaking into your reality. Okay? We can't lose sight of that. In fact, he tells us, you know what? You've got to be actively seeking God's kingdom. Because in his kingdom, we find hope. And in his kingdom, we find healing. And in his kingdom, we find purpose and we find life and so much more. Right? We've got to be seeking his kingdom. Jesus calls us to this. Right? This is... This is actually our theme verse for, for this year, for this season of our church. Matthew 6.33, but you seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek it first, right? And all of these other things that, that he listed off that we kind of worry about, that we wonder about, all of these things that, that in life that we need, God will provide those as well, right? I know I'm paraphrasing. It's on the screen for you. Now, we get that this is not a physical kingdom with nations or or borders, right? Because it's, it's God that we're talking about. God who, who cannot be confined, who cannot be contained because He's beyond us. He's holy. We talked about that a few weeks ago, okay? And because God is greater than we could possibly comprehend, you have to understand that His kingdom is also greater than we could possibly even imagine, okay? And so where God is, wherever God is, that's where His kingdom is, Okay, And so wherever God rules his kingdom, man, it is breaking in. And whenever God moves his kingdom, it just breaks out and lives are changed and, and people are receiving hope and life and purpose, right? Lives are forever changed for the better when God moves. And so every time someone says yes to God, that's the kingdom. Every time someone turns to Jesus and, and receives forgiveness and confesses their sin and invites him into their lives, the leader, that's the kingdom. Right? And anytime someone opens their life even more fully and says, God, I know that I'm saved, but, but I just sense that there's more for me that you have for me. There's more that I need to, to learn about you. Every time I open my life more fully to God, that's the kingdom. You see this now? Right? And every one of those moments, God's kingdom advances and it enlarges and it takes more territory away from the enemy. You with me? Okay. We need to be seeking this because in all of those moments and so many more, that's when God's glory and God's power and God's love and God's life, man, it is just revealed. His kingdom is breaking in. And while we see God's kingdom in part in this world, we know that one day it's going to come in its fullness. And all of this junk that, that we have to put up with, all of the heartache and all of the suffering, all of that, God says, is just going to be swept away, and He's going to usher in a new heaven and a new earth, and we are going to live, and we're going to reign with Him for all eternity in His everlasting kingdom. One day, that is going to be our reality. You just praise Him for that today? Amen? Yeah. Okay. But right now, we live in this in-between time. In the midst of suffering and his kingdom that's just breaking in, heart after heart and life after life. And so we live with this patient endurance as we watch God move in miraculous ways. Like I said, this is really the theme verse for this season in the life of our church because we're looking at, at God's vision and, and we're pursuing this calling to enlarge his kingdom here in Wabash knowing that we're just part of, part of what he's doing here. But it's thrilling to know that he's not finished with us and he's calling us to a new level. He's calling us to reach more people, to connect more people, and we're trying to enlarge our facility. We get that because we want to have more space for more people to gather in to worship Jesus, right? And, and, and we're actively seeking God's kingdom. And so that's what next week is really celebrating in our lives is we just take time to just recenter ourselves again so that we're actively seeking and pursuing his kingdom. And we're just going to declare to God again, God, we're going to continue to give. 
and we're going to continue to pray, and we're going to continue to share Jesus with every person that we can possibly share Jesus with. We're going to continue, God, to say yes to you and to your leading, and that's what this whole Believe Brunch and Believe Celebration weekend is really all about. So make sure you're carving out time next Saturday to be a part of that as we gather. And, uh, and man, one area... Just one area where we get to celebrate God and His moving in our life is, is you know, that financial picture. We kind of keep that in your bulletin where we're sitting at. We're sitting right on the verge of $91,000. And I just believe that God has something great in store for us just next week. Where I think He's going to push us over the top of that first $100,000 mark, right? And I don't know how it's going to happen. I know it's not in my bank account. Maybe it's in yours right? Maybe it's in someone that you know. You just call them up on the phone and say, hey, we got this great thing. You need to give to this, right? God's going to move. He's got the answer. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to actively seek his kingdom, and he's going to take care of the rest because that's his promise, and that's what we're living out in the life of our church. I'll get off of that. I'll share more of that next week, okay? But we need to be actively seeking his kingdom. That's what John begins showing us, right? But he shows us something else. Let's get back into verse 9, but let's get the second half of that now, okay? Second half of verse 9. Now, I was exiled to the island of Patmos, he says, for preaching the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. Testimony about Jesus, okay? So not only does John tell us that he, that he was suffering and, and seeking the kingdom, but he also tells us why now he's on Patmos, just in case there was any, any confusion about this, right? He didn't rob a liquor store. He didn't, he didn't rob Kroger's or something like this. No, he's there because he refused to back down. He refused to remain quiet about Jesus. He refused to stop sharing Jesus and living for Jesus. And because he refused to stop telling other people about Jesus and living for Jesus, he's now in prison for Jesus. Okay, that's why he's here. He also goes on in the next verse. I don't have it for you yet, but we'll look at it in a minute. To tell us that this is the Lord's Day. What we would call Sunday, right? Uh, the Lord's Day references the day that Jesus rose from the dead. We know that he rose on the first day of the week or on Sunday. That's why we still gather together on Sunday to look and worship him today, right? And so this one Sunday, he points out, and really he's telling us every Sunday, John made it a point to worship Jesus even in prison, even in prison. And so this is what he shows us. So whether he was a free man and he's moving around, he's preaching, and he's just celebrating with God's people all over the Roman Empire, or whether he's in prison and he's separated and he's miles away from friends and family and he's all alone and he's living a life very different than what he wants. John consistently lived out his faith. John consistently lived out his faith and that's what he teaches us to do, right? Every Sunday, every Sunday, he was showing up to worship Jesus. Every day of the week, he was consistent in living this life out with God, right? It wasn't just part of, of John's life. It wasn't just something he did only on Sundays, right? Life with Jesus was John's life. Absolutely consistent in living this 24-7, 365 days out of the year. And this is how we really position ourselves to experience the breakthrough moments, okay? Right, and here's the deal I, I don't want to gloss over. I, I get that when we open up the book of Revelation, we read chapter 1, right? It, it, this first chapter, it is this massive close encounter breakthrough moment in John's life, okay? But not every day on Patmos is like this. Not every day was filled with great visions from heaven. Jesus didn't just show up and say, Hey, John, how you doing, man? I'm in my glory. I'm just hanging with you today again. And not every day did that happen. It's tempting to believe that because when we read the Bible, man, moments like this just seem to happen every day. You read through Acts, and man, there's just these powerful things that are going on. You open up like the book of Revelation, here. wow, this massive moment, all these different encounters that we've been making our way through over this series. Okay, But the truth is, Man, there's a whole lot of normal days, just plain normal days for John on Patmos that we don't get to read about. It'd kind of be kind of boring. And on this day, I got up and I went and I hammered some rocks. And then I went to bed. And on day two, I got up and I hammered some rocks. And, and then I went to bed. Right? Normal days that John was going through. History tells us that he was on that island. You know, when he was sentenced, it was a life sentence. He, we know that he was there for about 18 months. 
before he was finally released because the new emperor came to power. We get to see a close encounter on one of those days. That means there's 546 other normal days that John spent on Patmos. And I say that because sometimes we grow inconsistent in living life with Jesus and in showing up in our relationship when we don't see these massive breakthrough moments every day. Well, I, Pastor, I read my Bible, but I didn't get anything out of it today. I spent time in prayer, but I didn't, I didn't just experience angels singing in my house today. I, I tried to worship at church, but man, I just didn't feel it. The songs just, they weren't for me today. Sometimes you have normal days. We're up and down emotionally when that happens though, right? Because of what we're going through, you know, life, we're up and down because of what we're facing. And sometimes when we don't see God do the incredible, we grow impatient. But one of the great truths that John shares with us is, man, we got to be consistent in living this life with Jesus every day, 24-7, 365 days out of a year. Because even on those normal days, even if we don't see it, if we don't feel it, God is still moving. God is still working. God is bringing things together, right? And, and just because we don't see him move doesn't mean he's not moving. We're talking about a holy God here who lives on a completely different level than what you and I do. And he tells us the truth. He says, you know what? I get it. You're not going to get me because my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I know that you're not going to always understand because my ways are higher than your ways. I am painting on a canvas greater than you could possibly even imagine. But I'm moving to bring breakthrough into your life. And the danger is that we miss it because we don't show up. We're not consistent. I mean, can you imagine how much all of us would have missed if John was like, you know what? Oh, man, I just don't feel like getting out of bed today. Life was so hard yesterday. Patmos is killing me. I just, you know what? I know it's Sunday, but I'm just going to sleep in today, God, just this once. I'm going to sleep in. And we would have missed out on one of the greatest visions that God has ever given us, this great glimpse of heaven and glory and everything that he has for us. Oh, we belong to a God who is on the move. And to really see him and experience that, we've got to be consistent in living out our faith with him in the normal and in the incredible, okay? Because if we show up with God in the normal, that means we're not going to miss it when God does the incredible. You with me? Okay. Now, there's one more truth that John shows us here about how to position ourselves. Let's get back into verse 10 here. So on the Lord's day, like I was telling you, right, he... It says, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice that sounded like a trumpet. I'll just pause there. We know that that's Jesus, and we read what Jesus kind of opens up. But John says, you know what, I was in the Spirit. And it's a, it's a phrase, and in one sense means that he was caught up in the Holy Spirit into this vision where he sees the risen Jesus in all of his glory, and, and so much more is, is revealed to him than even just what we glimpsed in chapter 1, Right? But there's another sense in how this phrase, in the Spirit, is, is also being used in this passage. In fact, if you were just to jump back with me, there's an encounter in the Gospel of John that he actually wrote down as biography of Jesus. In chapter 4, where we see an encounter between Jesus and a Samaritan woman, and they're having this discussion, right? And she shifts this discussion into worship and, and, uh, and, and starts, they start talking about the right way and the wrong way to worship and the right place and the wrong place to worship. And Jesus just gives this massive declaration. This is what he says. A time is coming and has now even come when true worshipers of God will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Because God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship in the Holy Spirit and in truth, okay? And so while John is absolutely caught up into this vision, and that's part of what this phrase, I'm, and I was in the Spirit, that's part of what that means. He's also telling us when he says in the Spirit that he's taking time to intentionally worship God. And that's really the next truth that he gives us, that to really experience breakthrough, man, we've got to make the choice to intentionally worship Jesus even in the middle of our struggle, Okay, so can you just picture this for a moment? Put yourself in John's shoes, right? He's in 
prison. He's in this hard labor camp. Every day, his job is to chisel rocks. But he just takes that Sunday, and just for a moment, he lifts his eyes to heaven. He's not staring at the chains that he's wearing. He's not staring at that rocky crag of an island. And just for a moment, he worships Jesus. And I don't know what song he sang, but maybe, maybe something like this. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. And I'm going to sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Right? And as he's worshiping and as he's singing on that rocky forsaken crag in the middle of the Mediterranean, suddenly just God breaks through in this incredible way and he just rips open this, this barrier between John and, and heaven and suddenly he hears all of the angels, all of creation singing, holy, holy, holy man is the Lord God almighty who was and is and is to come. And now he's singing even louder with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings because you are my everything and I will adore you. Man. John, he positioned himself and he prepared himself for breakthrough because he made the choice, I'm going to worship in the midst of my struggle. And he just declares to God, God, you are greater. You are greater than what I'm facing. And I may not see what you're doing. I don't see the purpose in why I'm here on Patmos. But this is what I know. I know that you are good. And I know that your love, it endures forever. And I know that you have a plan and a purpose for my life. I know your promises and I'm claiming them. And I choose in this moment to look to you and not to look at my problem, not to look at my situation because what I need, God, is breakthrough. I just need to see you. And so I'm lifting my eyes to you. Man, we all need God to break through, don't we? Because we all face in difficult situations where we just see God, we long to see Him break in and break through to our lives. We want to see Jesus more clearly. And the truth that I hope that you are hearing is that God wants that more for you than you even want it. He wants to break into your life. But to really receive that and to really experience and to really live in that breakthrough Man, we've got a position, we've got to prepare ourselves to be ready for it. And that means actively, consistently, intentionally pursuing Jesus every day, every normal day of our lives. And I get it, that is not always easy. But Kirk, man, it's so hard. I'm going through this. I know. I have my own deals that I go through. I don't wake up feeling awesome every day. I know you probably think I do. It's that pastor privilege, right? I just wake up, put the halo on, and blah, awesome day. Katie will tell you that's not always the case, right? Some days she wakes up cranky. Some days she lets me sleep in. That's how it works. We've got to actively, consistently, intentionally pursue God especially when we're struggling, especially when we're in the middle of a battle, when we're holding the line spiritually, so to speak. We've got to actively, intentionally, consistently show up. And that's where I think the message Jesus gives John is just so huge. Because here's the deal. John, and John alone, gets this massive vision, right? And it's a message that's actually to people who didn't see Jesus in this moment people who are just kind of like you and me. They're living out normal days, but they're in the midst of struggle. But then they heard from John who told them, you guys, you are never, ever, ever, ever going to believe this. I mean, I was worshiping one Sunday and I was in the last place you would expect this. To, I was on Patmos, man. The last place you'd ever expect God to show up. But I mean, he showed up. I mean, massive show up. And his hair, I mean, it was white. And his eyes were like blazing fire. And his face, I mean, just 
Everything about him was glowing in his glory. And he just starts declaring that I am the living one. And, and you got to know that I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. I'm almighty God. Right? That's what he's telling us. And he's declaring his might. He's declaring his power. And, and he's telling us, there is no one like me, John. There's no one like our God, guys. There's no one. Well, here's the best part you can't miss. When I turned around to see who it was, I saw these seven lampstands, and, and then I look up, and it's Jesus, and he's got seven stars that he's holding in his hand, right? And, and here's the best part. You see those seven lampstands? They represent you. And here's his message. Even on those normal days, and, and maybe it's an up day, maybe it's a down day that you're facing. I don't know what you're going through right now. But on those days, you've got to know that Jesus, man, he is with you. He's living right there with you. You can't see him, I get that, but he's with you. He's pouring himself into you. But even greater than that, man, he's holding on to you. Man, you're those stars in his hand. There is nothing that's coming against you that, that can snatch you from that. He's pouring himself into you. He's got you in his grip. He's not about to let go because you are absolutely priceless and precious to him. Oh, man, you just need to know that you belong to a God who is on the move. And man, he's in control and he is undefeated and he is bringing his victory into your life. Okay, now here's the deal. Whether you see the vision of Jesus or you just hear the message, that, that's got to wake you up because that's breakthrough that's happening right now. Spiritual breakthrough because Jesus changes everything. And so maybe today you just needed to hear that message and be encouraged to just hold on to him because you're going through a difficult time. Man, I'm praying with you and you've got a God who is not about to let go of you. And in moments like this when we're really struggling, it's good to just draw close to him and just declare again our dependency. and God, I can't fix this. I don't have the strength. But I'm not going to look at my inadequacies right now. In this moment, I'm going to choose to just cast myself on you. Just climb up in your arms. Let you hold me in this moment. And I'm just going to declare again how big you are and how much greater you are than whatever I'm facing. I'm just going to do that today, God. And I just need you to break through to my life and just minister to me, touch me today. And maybe you don't see it yet. But you can get yourself ready for that breakthrough. You can prepare. You can position yourself. And, and I get that sometimes we get distracted in life. But today we can all renew our commitment and say, God, you know what? I'm going to actively seek your kingdom. I'm going to do all I can to, to pursue you. And I'm going to share you with everyone around. I'm going I'm to pursue your kingdom, God. And I'm going to consistently live out this life with you. Every day, we're going to have time together. I don't want to miss a moment because it might be the moment that you're going to break in. You're going to change every. I don't want to miss. I'm going to show up every day because I believe you're working. And I'm just going to hang with you, God. And God, I'm going to take this moment right now in my life and in the middle of what I'm facing. And you know what? I'm not going to let the lie be that this thing's bigger than me. It is bigger than me. That's the truth, God. But I know that you're even bigger. And I'm going to lift my eyes off of this deal. I'm going to put them on you. I'm just going to worship you for who you are and your love for me and all that you're doing for me in my life and in our church. And God, you're just so wonderful. I choose to worship you.